everybody coming into our kitchen conversations. It looks like our Facebook friends are starting to join us. It is a windy and beautiful day here in the Pacific Northwest, and I am very excited about our show today. We have Paul Roberts with us, um, and Paul has an amazing resume. I'm going to tell you a couple of his current titles. Um, Paul's a current city uh, Everett City Councilman. He also is the Vice Chair of Sound Transit and the Chair of the Puget Sound Clean Energy Agency. And, um, and I tell you, all those hats, they really do intersect in really important ways. Um, and that's why I've invited Paul on today to talk with us about transportation and, and really the climate. Um, I also have to mention, Paul, that you are a former school board director for the Everett School District. And so that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, but welcome, Paul, to Kitchen Conversations. Well, April, thank you for having me. And um, lest I forget, thank you for the work you're doing uh, for our kids, because the school board work is just the very best. I can Absolutely. How much fun it was to go to graduations. I didn't realize until I started my first year. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this is fun. And it's the most exciting, yeah. exciting thing. So that's really great work. And thanks for doing that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. And, um, and I know the folks that you're representing or that the, all the different hats that you're wearing in the community. Um, did you want to say a little bit about that and, and uh, some of those, um, some of that work? Yeah, let me, thank you. Let me speak to that. So yeah, I do wear a, a lot of hats. I'm sort of like a walking millinery store with all these <laughs> hats. But um, so yes, I'm on the Everett City Council. I am uh, the chair of the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency Board, which covers the four county regions of Snohomish, King, uh, Kitsap, and Pierce. And then uh, I'm vice chair of the Sound Transit Board, which covers the three county region on mm -hmm. uh, part of the Puget Sound region. Um, I also, I do consulting work uh, in environment and economics and policy uh, and have for a number of years. But I'm here as a individual. I'm not here representing any of those boards or organizations. Uh, so the comments that I make today are really my own and not on behalf of any of those entities. Because uh, I don't, uh, you know, those are decisions. I, I, I've long since known, and you do this uh, with school board, we don't speak for the board. And yeah. I'm not speaking for those agencies today, but, but I'm sure happy to uh, bring uh, whatever expertise I can to these issues. So thanks for that. Absolutely. Having yeah, no, and thank you for that, because that's very true. It's always, I always say, um, you know, the, the boards and committees we sit on, they're team sports. <laughs> and so we're just, we're just individuals on those, those amazing teams. Well, Gal, let's just jump into it and, and talk about um, the climate a little bit, just to, to start things off. And um, there are so many areas that we need to improve our transportation infrastructure just to make it less harmful for our environment, right? So that intersection between the climate and transportation. Um, and I'm thinking of examples like the, the 2018 Supreme Court case that we had that really um, protected our salmon um, and, and that really affected the road design and our, our culverts. Um, we've got these incredible surroundings in our state and while our jobs and schools and they attract more people here, what can we do to protect the resources and the environment as it relates to transportation? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So, and I, I want to put this question in a uh, really sort of a context for all mm -hmm. of the other questions that follow. But um, you know, I've been a student of this since the 70s and, uh, and the data that we've had on these issues mm -hmm. has not only have we known for many years that uh, greenhouse gases were impacting our climate, but the data has gotten better and consistent mm -hmm. in terms of the basic theories it's no longer a question, it's decided science. Yes. And so let me give you a sense of a perspective. Um, and this largely comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which is sort of the gold standard uh, of thousands of scientists around the globe. Mm -hmm. They published a study in 2018 that was intended to really give us a clear focus. And, mm -hmm. um, and to put that in perspective, what we know today is that climate has warmed by uh, on average one degree Celsius. Mm -hmm. In that time, we are seeing 
now dramatically as we just finished uh, dealing with fires and smoke, we are seeing a dramatic increase in the frequency, in the intensity, and in the severity of mm -hmm. event of what we call climate influenced events. So mm -hmm. those fires, floods, storms, uh, rain events, droughts, uh, but increased frequency, increased intensity, which mm -hmm. is the way we measure these kinds of events, and severity is the economic impact. Uh, we will find a vaccine for COVID. We yeah. will move forward, mm -hmm. but we will not find a vaccine for the Earth's temperature. The number one task wow. is to reduce fossil fuels and, wow. they, and, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that means it has huge impacts for transportation. It has mm -hmm. huge impacts for our economy. We need to build a clean energy economy. And yeah. that, that's, that's the, the, those are the hard realities. The good news side of this is we here in Washington State, and in particular Snohomish County, are mm -hmm. really well positioned to build that economy that we need. That's clean energy, water, mm -hmm. agriculture, forestry, building materials, transportation. We have a lot of deep roots here. Absolutely. So when we think of transportation, we really need to think, how will that new economy be built? And how can we use and trans translate that and transfer that to clean energy? I love that. And I, um, and I think it's really true just to emphasize the point you just made um, that, you know, we can get a vaccine for COVID, but we can't, there's no quick fix. There's no shot that you can take to bring back our climate to, to go backwards. And so I think, um, I think we have to be mindful of that as we're talking about um, our economy and moving forward. And so I, I think one of the things um, that came up in, in one of my town halls that I thought was interesting as we're talking about this um, is that, you know, we've got a lot of jobs now that are being done at home. Um, and should we be incentivizing employers to permanently, um, you know, offer work from home solutions? Because again, that will affect transportation, that'll affect tr uh, congestion. And, and honestly, it would, it would affect the environment. So should we be incentivizing those employers to, to have folks work from home even post uh, COVID? Well, first of all, it's a great question and a great issue. Mm -hmm. um, I guess there's probably a, a debatable points uh, in, in that regard. But what I'm seeing, uh, and it's very much an, uh, an evolving issue yeah. right now, but what I'm seeing is, uh, I don't know that we need to incentivize it so much as we need to track what's actually happening. That is yeah, say, that's a good point. The private sector is making mm -hmm. these decisions we happen to be in a part of the world mm -hmm. where we have tons of really, really bright uh, uh, technology people. And mm -hmm. so between here and California are probably two of the biggest centers on the planet in terms of, yep. uh, art, in terms of uh, internet communication technologies, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence technologies. And we've all seen an explosion in the platforms upon mm -hmm. which we're dealing with right now. I mean, exactly, like our Zoom platform. Yeah, platform. <laughs> and so, exactly. And so the private sector is actually responding very well, I think. In, in, That's a good point. In, uh, in, in this, and the real interest and issue for, uh, at least for me, as I'm studying this, is what will happen with real estate what will happen with commercial mm, real estate that's what good with the way we do business and jobs some jobs will have to be place bound yeah. others not and so i think that we will continue to see this evolve certainly over the next couple of years yeah. but i don't think we'll go back to the way things were before i wish i knew what they will look like but i don't yeah. think, I think they'll look differently well, and that's a good point. And since we're talking about jobs, um, so is there a climate conscious way to offer a chance to create new jobs, new green jobs around the state? Um, if we're looking at, so we've got jobs that are now being done in a new way, but now if we're looking at new jobs, is there a way to, to really create those new green climate conscious jobs um, around our state? Yes. Uh, and I think it's, uh, there's some real exciting awesome. possibilities. So let's just take a couple of those real quickly. First, let's mm -hmm. talk about energy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and if we look at it from the standpoint of trying to reverse trends that are harmful, mm -hmm. uh, 
probably the uh, most important thing we can do is put a price on carbon. Now, yes. the rest of the world has figured this out. We're still struggling. Yeah, the carbon tax, we got to get there. We have to get yeah. there. And I call it a carbon fee because the mm. emissions from burning carbon are the yeah. poison that's poisoning the planet. Mm -hmm. So it's not, to me, it's not a tax from an economics point of view. It's a fee. We're it's trying fee. to mm -hmm. recapture the external costs. We call it externalizing. And sorry to be wonky, but I'm- okay. No, I love that. The, I'm, I'm taking notes. I don't know about our viewers at home, but I, I'm taking notes, Paul. <laughs> So when we when we burn fossil fuel as one example, and there are mm -hmm. others, but uh, the emissions go into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We we don't pay for those, but we pay for them externally because the cost of storm events, the cost of flooding, the cost that's of pollution, true. that's now borne by the broader community. Yes. And so we call that in economics externalizing the cost. So to me, this is a way of recapturing some of those costs. And so uh, we need to put a price on carbon. Europe has done this, uh, Asia has yep. done this, other modern nations have do done this and they're doing more of it. In mm -hmm. the West Coast of the United States, California, Oregon, and oh, British yep. Columbia have all taken steps yep. in this regard. Washington has not yet done so. So that's number one. Number two is looking at new clean energy forms of transportation looking mm -hmm. at clean energy forms for buildings, building and transportation are the greatest generators. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have brilliant thinkers here with uh, technology and uh, Microsoft and, and Google and Amazon and others. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, they are developing the technologies that will help us uh, deal with these issues. The, the other ones are, are those issues that are going to be driven economically around the globe such as water. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I published a study uh, a couple of years ago now that looked at water, that it looked at, at energy, water, agriculture, forestry, and building materials. Those are all sectors mm -hmm. that we have a strength, uh, historic strength in this state. And uh, we found yeah. in each of those cases, there are real opportunities and there are markets globally for the research and development and for new product development. Uh, and uh, so the idea of a green economy is to build that. And the other is infrastructure. We are, mm -hmm. we are going to have to rebuild a lot of infrastructure over the course of the next 20 years to mm -hmm. deal with water, storm events, uh, sea level, uh, and so uh, and transportation, which will be uh, impacted by those events. As we do that, we need to build a smarter, greener uh, infrastructure. And so there are real opportunities here. Well, and it sounds like we're in a great position. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm thinking about it. Uh, one of the ones that started to emerge uh, it, globally, but now here locally, is cross laminated mm -hmm. timber, which is a building material oh. that is much, much greener and allows us to build uh, structures differently and uh, uh, more intense development. So, and that's right here in, in, our, in our own backyard. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, and again, I, you know, learning part of this, these kitchen conversations is about learning. And so folks at home can learn, I can learn. And I will tell you, I've never heard of cross laminated timber. So that is something. Um, and I think, so what I'm getting from you is that we've got opportunities, right? We've got opportunities because geographically, um, and also just the type of um, just where we are in terms of our environment, our natural environment in our state, it sounds like we've got amazing opportunities to be on the forefront um, with some of the development, like you were saying, R&D, when it comes to moving the ball ahead on um, clean jobs and a clean economy. So um, I, I just, I, I want to take that, you know, take that to heart as I'm, I'm going to Olympia and making, hopefully making decisions that can affect that new clean green economy. Um, and, and kind of going, you know, sticking on the jobs factor, um, a lot of folks are, you um, thinking about, um, you know, during, we're looking at the commute during this pandemic, we know that there's um, income inequality, um, higher income residents have tended to uh, transition more easily to this remote work and this remote work environment. 
Um, but folks that are that were considered essential frontline workers are folks like in our uh, service manufacturing, um, you know, grocery store workers. They haven't had that opportunity. Um, and as we see, you know, poor individuals, they have to take our public transportation. They, they are taking it and it, it is a little bit more risky because of the virus. Um, in the short term, transportation wise, and I, and I feel like all of this does, I'm glad we started with the environment. It all goes back to our environment. Um, but how do we mitigate this disparity? Like what are, if you have some thoughts on that? Uh, well, again, great question. So um, one of the, the uh, areas that um, I, I do uh, work with with Sound Transit is I, I chair what's called the Ridership Experience and Operations Committee. And okay. a fancy way of saying the stuff that's actually happening now, not the, yeah, the user experience. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and so um, one of the things that we track carefully is ridership. And of course, during the pandemic, ridership mm -hmm. is just tanked. I mean, we've just yeah. had huge reductions. But one of the aspects of that is looking at where it's still uh, higher than some other places. And mm -hmm. not surprisingly, very much to your question, where we see the ridership uh, still being higher, relatively yes. speaking, is in Everett, South King County, International District, uh, those areas where we know we have a higher concentration of low-income people. Yep. So we, we know this is their only way to get around. The only way to go. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And so we know that there are some real equity issues here. And, uh, and what, so one of the things that we've been doing at Sound Transit, but I, I know this is true for all the transit agencies, they're trying to determine what are the best health practices mm -hmm. to keep those coaches and trains and so on clean mm -hmm. and, and distancing and asking people to wear masks and doing mm -hmm. the things that we know that those things work. We know yep. that work. Absolutely. So we can do a lot to make these systems safer. And of course, uh, as we come out of this, um, having that capacity uh, there is really important. So we, have, we all have some really tough decisions to make because ridership has gone down, revenue has gone down, but the need to get those first line responders, you know, they can't work from home. Yeah, We absolutely. need to help them get to work and that's their only way of, of really functioning. And uh, so that's, a, that's uh, you know, we're just trying to do the very best we can uh, to give that, to make that service available to them. And that's really good to hear. And it's really good to hear that as um, as an organization that you are looking at that specifically, because I think sometimes um, I think sometimes it feels like the disparities aren't seen and are they being paid attention to. So it's good that you're um, that that those committees are existing within Sound Transit and other other agencies um, that are looking at it because we, we have to identify them so that we can fix them. Um, so before we move on to our next question, we have one from our from our Facebook audience um, that I thought I'd pitch out to you. Um, and so one of our viewers wants to know, would cap and trade uh, just lead to large corporations? buying up all the carbon credits from smaller companies leading to the large corps not transitioning to lower carbon options. So kind of a detailed question, but, um, but is that one that you could, you feel comfortable answering? Well, I can answer it in part. I mean, I, I, uh, I have a bias and, and it is not in favor of cap and trade, but, but there's sort of an order of, of, of priority here. The first priority is to price carbon and there's more than okay. one way to do that. Uh, a a well-managed cap and trade system will do that. And, and the, the real key is that it, this is a devil's in the details question. So oh, got how it. does that system work and try to mm -hmm. avoid situations where there's an inequity in mm -hmm. the offsetting of those, of those price mechanisms. But that's why from my perspective, the best way is to provide a more basic uh, carbon fee structure uh, as opposed to cap and trade. But priority one is to price the carbon. So we have to sort of look at that. And, and that's mm -hmm. a discussion that I'm uh, hopeful that you'll have, be a part of uh, soon. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in the legislature, uh, because I do think it will be on the table this year. I know that both the ch chairs of the House and Senate Transportation Committees mm -hmm. have packages that include some kind of carbon pricing. Carbon yep. fee, uh, or, uh, you can call it carbon tax, but I prefer, prefer the other 
it's going to happen in terms yeah. of discussion. I don't know if it'll, I don't know what the legislature will do, but I do know it'll be on the table. Well, and I'm hoping that we can move, um, that we can get it across the finish line this time. And I like the way you put it at carbon C. And I think, um, and thank you for that question, because I think that that gets to the nuance of what we're talking about. So these aren't simple um, decisions. They aren't just, you know, they're, they're not taglines, if you will. Um, and I think by by me understanding, you know, the difference between calling it a fee <laughs> and calling it a tax, right? And so that we can really dig into the nuance of how that fee is structured. So that's structured in a way that we don't, um, that we don't have issues like the one that was pointed out in the question. So yeah, you you can absolutely count on me to pick your brain, Paul, because I will be doing that. And uh, and um, and I love some of the the white papers that you've been a part of um, putting together about you know not just um, not just carbon fees, but also you know our next next step in our green economy because that's really really important. So thank you for that. And if anyone else has questions, definitely put them into our Facebook chat. We'd love to, to get to them. Um, so an, another question, just to kind of talk a little bit more about specific transportation um, projects. Uh, the 44th is all about transportation. And we've seen ongoing construction on light rail. <laughs> and uh, in here in the 44th, we are dealing with inadequacies on the highway to trestle every day, but with shortfalls looming, we're just kind of facing the fact that transit um, might be operating at reduced capacity. And so how do we justify um, long-term commitments, dollar commitments into these projects when we've got reduced capacity, um, uh, you know, in terms of ridership? Well, once again, right on point. And, and your district is so, so involved in transportation and really yeah, you know, I, I, I could go on, but your people know this better than I do. But the, the, as the legislature approaches this issue, uh, first, in terms of the big projects, there are several mega projects that are going to be front and center. Uh, one of them is the US2 trust. Yeah. And so that is a big, that, that's, I think, on people's radar now. And in fact, I spent a fair amount of this morning in meetings uh, talking about what will come before the legislature on that subject. Oh, awesome. Uh, secondly, is the Columbia River crossing. So the bridge mm -hmm. between uh, Vancouver and Portland. Uh, and that's a mega project. And, and the mm -hmm. third, which has evolved, uh, uh, emerged, is the West Seattle Bridge. Yes. So these are all going to be big projects. The challenge that, that we all have, and of course you it, it, as a legislator will have, is that COVID has impacted the, the gas tax budget, the transportation budget yeah. in big, big ways. The other pieces that are important are the culverts, which are the mm -hmm. federal uh, court order to yeah. for budget from car taps. Yeah. And so, you know, you put all these two things together and it's a, it's a tough, tough order. It's not pretty. <laughs> But, it, but I do think that one of the opportunities is to look at carbon pricing as a mm -hmm. revenue source that helps us get at these projects. And Absolutely. when we talk about a clean economy and clean transportation, we're not talking about no transportation and we're not talking mm -hmm. about no roads. I mean, Highway 9 is a huge problem in your district yes. and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it will remain a huge problem and it needs attention. So we're talking about a way of bringing all of these pieces together, but do it in a cleaner way. But I think, you know, these are tough. These are tough yeah. decisions. And I, I hope that we can find our way forward to address the, what, what are called the next increment of projects. Absolutely. And I think, um, and for me, you know, one question that I get from uh, constituents a lot is, you know, what's the benefit? What's the economic benefit from investing in transportation? Um, it, because it's... And I get it, you know, folks, it's it's dollars. And again, dollars during a pandemic, dollars when it seems like, well, we could be spending this on something else. Um, the reality is, right, that it's it's separate than, than the general fund budget. But um, I guess, what would you tell someone who said, you know, what's the benefit of uh, investing in transportation? And is there a cost to waiting? Is there a cost to kind of saying, you know, we'll get to it later? Uh, it's a, again, great question. The hu there are huge benefits. The it, it, without, and I, I, I was involved in my world in uh, aerospace for many years, and I actually did the public sector, all of the public sector work on aerospace for 777 and 87. Oh, nice. Uh, 
and we had to, we have to think in terms of moving people and good mm -hmm. and if we can't do that the economy is crippled and when that mm -hmm. happens everything else is uh is also uh yeah is, it's it, all impacted it, it does it works as a system so we have to think about ways to efficiently mm -hmm. move people and goods mm -hmm. and uh i think i met, forgot the other part of your question but and just is there a is there a cost of waiting like is there a is there kind of a is, is there a downside to waiting and pushing this off there is we call it in economics terms we call it the time value of money so mm -hmm. get, everything gets more expensive to some greater or lesser degree as you go out in time so mm -hmm. to the extent that you can fund something now you uh you actually have a, a, an economic benefit to doing Got so. It. Um, so yes yeah that makes sense that makes absolute sense um and so another one from one of our facebook view viewers <laughs> I will um, pop this in here and thank you guys so much for chiming in. Um, it, uh, this viewer says, thank you for ta uh, talking on this issue. We must support the clean energy economy that is defining this century and pro proving successful in other countries. Um, will you support legislation that sets an end date for gas powered vehicles and prohibits state funding of gas powered vehicles? Um, and this is from Bill Truitt, who is a member of the Snohomish chapter of the Climate Reality Project. Um, I, I know it's probably more for me, right, than you <laughs> asking what my legislative, but but I'm going to kind of turn it around because there, there has been talk, you know, we, we see in California where they did pass legislation on an end date. I guess from your perspective, um, being a leader in this space, Paul, like what are your thoughts of legislation like that on setting end dates for gas powered vehicles and prohibiting state funds for gas powered vehicles? Well, I first of all, I think it needs to be on the table. I, I don't think that we can, I, I think. Yeah. I guess the way I would put it is, you will be dealing with the laws that affect human beings. Yeah. But laws of nature don't need a police force. Uh, mm. the laws of chemistry and physics and math are going to apply. Uh, yeah. We're not, there, there are no easy solutions here. So I think those issues need to be on the table. But my personal belief is that uh, the first thing is to get the pricing to price the poison, I call it price the poison that's poisoning <laughs> the planet. When you do that, I like that. Mm -hmm. you, you disincentivize those things which are harmful and you incentivize those things which are not. Mm -hmm. And incentivizing clean economic development uh, will come from that. Now, I, I do think all these, all things need to be on the table. I think we're really past the point, you know, we're, we're, we're worse off because we have chosen to ignore uh, yep. the realities. And so I don't think we can afford to ignore options, but I do think that we have some options that are readily available to us Absolutely. and others that are less so, but we need to take the low hanging fruit right now. Yeah, no, and thank you for that answer. Cause I think, um, and I, and, if you watch enough of my shows, you know, I always come out with a mantra. Like I always, guests always end up saying something with a mantra. And so I think the mantra from this show is gonna be price the poison. <laughs> Um, and I think that's a good way of looking at it and, and build to your question. Um, I don't want to discourage it, but I will say that I am in favor of a, uh, a carbon tax and I am in favor of, of getting there. And I think part of it um, that really pains me is that we're so far behind, even in that conversation on the West Coast, right? We've got our, our uh, sister states who are, are far beyond us in that. And so I want to get us there. Um, and I do support Governor Inslee's. Um, I think he did set an end date for gas powered uh, vehicles, state vehicles, um, or at least he suggested one. And so that is definitely something I support. And I think we, we, to your point, Paul, everything has to be on the table because this is a climate emergency. It went from a crisis to an emergency. And so we've got to put really everything on the table. Um, and so that's, thank you for that question. Um, because I think as we move into this next session, we can't forget about these important issues. We can't uh, be, be, be laser focused on, um, we can't be laser focused on the public health crisis and forget everything else because I think it all connects. 
Truly. Um, and I guess, you know, just lastly, because we both have this passion for education, um, you know, education has been kind of central you know, to our public service. And so there's been kind of a complicated uh, history between education and transportation. And so do you see any opportunities to use transportation to um, reform educational inequities or just, you know, what do you see as a role for transportation in education? Um, you know, that's an interesting question because the whole re relationship of transportation to education is very place bound. That is yes. to say, it's very different depending on where the, which school district are you talking about and, and how might yep. transportation help make it more or less efficient. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's a, a, an important aspect of this to help educate our, our children about the importance of transportation in terms of clean energy. I think Absolutely. we have a real opportunity to do that. Uh, and, um, and so I, I, you know, I think there's sort of both in the classroom and getting to and from the classroom. And they're two different issues, but they do, mm -hmm. they do sort of come together on this. And by the Absolutely. way, I spent a lot of time working on uh, what we call bus change outs to uh, get cleaner diesel engines and just simply cleaner air quality for, uh, for mm -hmm. our, uh, our uh, students throughout the state. Well, in the case, this case, the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency in the three county region, but it's become an issue that is sta really statewide. statewide. Absolutely. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. It's um, it, when we talk about transportation and education, it is they are so connected. Um, and I think there's really an opportunity that we might be missing um, getting. I would love to see all of our K-12 kiddos have ORCA cards, um, much like our university system and really getting them used to using public transportation at a young age. Because I think that that habit will stick with them as they get older and see that as a viable option for for getting from point A to point B um, in a, in a very economical way. Um, so I, I kind of, I would be an, I would be an advocate of that <laughs> for sure. Great point. I, I, I really agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it looks like we're at the end of our time. This has been an absolute great conversation, Paul. I'm so excited that we um, were able to talk about transportation, especially as it relates to our climate. But I feel like this is going to be the first of many because this we could really go on. Uh, we could go on much longer because this is a deep issue. It's an issue with a lot of different um, tentacles, and I think it's important and and you know it's a climate emergency. So honestly, we have to keep this at the top of our priority list. We really do. Well, April, thank you so much. Thanks uh, to those who asked questions. They were great questions. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, anything I can do to help you, uh, you know, I'm all in. You're you're just a, you're just a great public servant. And thanks for what you're doing for our kids too. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And, and thank everyone at home for watching Kitchen Conversations today. Uh, don't forget to turn in next, tune in, turn in, tune in next week for a fantastic show. Uh, we'll be talking about healthcare uh, in, in some different ways and some new ways that you, you might not have thought of before. So again, thank you to everyone at home and thanks, Paul, and have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks, April. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.